Probably the most memorable uh, occasion uh, prior to the merger was, was the time of the decision in Louisville to go ahead with the formation of this church. We were there, uh, the AELC was in uh, uh, Cleveland and the ALC was in San Diego. And, and the, the uh, conventions were coordinated in such a way that, that we were in telephone conversation. And Martin Marty was announcing the outcome of the votes. And uh, we had the, the vote from, uh, from Cleveland and uh, AELC had voted unanimously in favor of merger. Uh, then the, the vote was announced in, uh, in Louisville by Bishop Crumley and it was overwhelmingly in favor of merger. And then we waited for a report from, uh, from San Diego uh, and something went wrong with the telephone connection. And so <laughs> the, 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 the entire uh, assembly was, was almost in limbo wondering what is that vote going to be? Because there, there were questions about whether the ALC would get the two-thirds vote needed. Well, finally it came through and uh, Dr. Preuss announced that the ALC had voted by more than 90%. Mm -hmm. and, and the pandemonium that broke loose in, in Cleveland was, was unimaginable. And for Corrine and me especially, because she grew up in the ALC, I grew up in the LCA prior to that Augustana, and she was in the visitor section and she was so elated that she she started moving toward me and I started moving toward her and we embraced and it was as though in a very personal way it was a microcosm uh, of, of the joy of these three churches saying we are going to be one church. And then uh, when I got elected to the uh, commission for a new Lutheran church that gave me an opportunity to be on the inside of, of those years of formation. And uh, I always have given thanks, especially when I was elected presiding bishop, for the experience of going through that process and watching it unfold. There was a hope that, that we could coordinate the work that we were doing. Bishops would not be crisscrossing the territory of another bishop to visit congregations. Uh, there was a sense that, that now we could work more efficiently as a churchwide organization across the country. There was also the hope that uh, being one church, we could relate more effectively to the global church, to the Lutheran World Federation. We wouldn't be sending three representatives, but only one, and uh, speak as, as a representative of that one church. There was also the hope that, uh, that possibly we could stimulate greater growth by being one church, develop more new missions, and uh, put ourselves in a, in a better position for, for, uh, for doing that. And I, I think uh, the other hope was that at, at the congregational level, uh, uh, churches that had been part of one and then the other and then even a third church body and feeling somewhat alienated from one another because of that would now feel that, okay, we're in the same family and we really belong together. Those, those were the kind of hopes that, that I think all of us had at that time. Probably the biggest challenge that uh, materialized was the financial um, uh, picture. If the CNLC made a major mistake, it had to be in anticipating much more income than actually came in. And we were forewarned by people like uh, Lyle Schaller who said, even though Lutherans may think they're different from others, you're going to experience some shortfall when, when, when the organization comes together because that just happens. He said it's like there's an accident that happened on the highway and everybody puts their foot on the brake just a little bit. So when you have a merger, uh, everybody's feeling, well, this is a new day, there's some upheaval here, and so there's some caution uh, waiting to see what this church is going to be like. Well, we came to the churchwide assembly, to the uh, Constituting Convention, rather, in Columbus with a high degree of enthusiasm. We're electing new leadership. Uh, uh, right, we're going to have a new office building in Chicago. Uh, the, there, there was enormous enthusiasm. And the best estimate of income that we could expect was $108 million. And the assembly got so excited about this merger that they said, let's go for $112 million. And no, no leader had been elected at that time. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, this is enthusiasm that's gone wild. Uh, and in retrospect, and others have said the same thing, we would have been much better had we planned more cautiously 
and uh, established a budget that was much more reasonable, one that we probably could have met and then built on that. What happened uh, as a result uh, of, of that decision was that uh, it almost gave a picture of failing and, and not, not measuring up to what we had thought we could be. Uh, I think that was a major mistake. I'd have to say in retrospect that uh, the, the decision of the, um, of the CNLC to, uh, to give no special consideration to people who had served on predecessor church staffs, uh, but rather to, to, to have the ground absolutely equal, uh, may have been a mistake. I think we lost a lot of very good talent, a lot of good experience by doing that. And the result was that even though the people that were selected were by and large wonderful, excellent people, everyone has that startup time that you have to deal with. And that to me was a uh, somewhat of a crippling effect on the early life of the church. Uh, possibly a third uh, area where I think that the uh, CNLC made a mistake was that uh, we, we thought that there should be smaller synods with uh, the bishop able to visit congregations more directly than had been the case in some of the predecessor church uh, uh, synods and districts. And uh, I was on the side of those who felt that, uh, that maybe that would be cumbersome to have so many synods. And it wasn't uh, long after the, uh, the formation of the church, uh, third or fourth year, when I began to even uh, speak to bishops and others about the possibility of cutting down the number of synods. And now I think that may be one of the issues we're going to have to face in the future as we, uh, as, as we look realistically at, at what we're able to do. Uh, but that, let me back up and say that, uh, that as a whole, I think that the CNLC did, did a very good job. There were extremely effective people uh, on the CNLC. Uh, I've singled out probably a dozen of them that I think uh, were uh, admirably uh, well suited for that important position. And even two or three without whom I don't think there would have been a merger. Uh, so CNLC did its job. I think it did it well, maybe made a few mistakes. Uh, mistakes were made. Uh, probably uh, one of the initial ones that I made was uh, to take an ecumenical journey very shortly after the church was born. Uh, the, the, the folks working with ecumenism were very eager to let this new church be known to significant places around the world. Uh, the Vatican, uh, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, uh, the Anglicans, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and so on. And I had mixed feelings about that, but I, I agreed that, all right, uh, it, it is important to give an early signal. So I, I did take that trip, and it was very heavily uh, publicized, cover of the Luther magazine and so on. And what I thought was a wise thing turned out to be very unwise, because somehow it gave the impression, even though there's only a very small part of my time, it gave the impression that this was the number one priority uh, for this new presiding bishop. And even though it is very important, uh, it, was, it, it, it was misunderstood. And I had to do some, some very hard work to, to make certain that uh, people understood that, uh, that it was not the number one priority. Like serving this church and, and, and helping pastors and, and uh, uh, encouraging congregational leadership was the, was the number one thing that, that I wanted to do. Uh, probably, uh, Another area where, where I might have gone back now and looked at it differently was, uh, was uh, in, 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 in the whole question of, of uh, how the leadership of the, of the uh, various units of the church were selected. Uh, that had to be done in large part prior to the coming together of the ELCA. So that by the time I was elected, uh, all of those uh, positions had been narrowed down, narrowed down to one or two candidates. And I, I would say in retrospect, I wish I'd put the brakes on that whole process if I could have, so that I, so that I might have uh, uh, joined in that search 
And I think in, in two or three areas th that the church would have been much stronger uh, had we been more patient in the way we, we got off and going. Those are a couple of areas where, in, in retrospect, I'd have to say, yeah, I, I wish that we had done things a bit differently or that I had maybe been uh, uh, able to be uh, uh, more integral to the process. Uh, I have to say that, uh, and I, I say this with a lot of, a lot of sadness, uh, Michael, because when I would go out and, and, and be among folks in the church, that there was great appreciation for, for leadership, but there was also uh, an element of uh, suspicion. Those people at Higgins Road, I would often hear, Higgins Road, and I often somewhat jokingly said that I think in the minds of some people, they think that there are there must be a gathering in Chicago every morning of 40 or 50 people, and the, the agenda item for that day is, how can we irritate the church today? And, and uh, I usually got a laugh from that, but it's very serious too, because there, there is that perception. And it, it pained me because I knew these people who were working for us. I knew that they were going the second and the third mile. Yes, of course, there were some weak links in that chain, but, but, but for the most part, and overwhelmingly, these were people who loved the Lord, who loved the church and gave themselves unselfishly to make sure we could be the best possible church. So that, that was a painful thing. But I just kept trying and trying uh, to help people understand that we were there to serve them and, and not to be served by them and that we wanted this church to be the very best that it could possibly be. In the, in the uh, structure of the ELCA, the Conference of Bishops, of course, is, is somewhat independent. They have their own chairperson, their own officers, and they, they cannot take legislative action. But when they make a recommendation, it carries enormous weight. And the reason is because we know that uh, nothing that the church does is going to go very far unless you have at least a strong majority of the synodical bishops who are, who are with you and, and, and working for you. Uh, I made a mistake there in that uh, I think I was uh, too uh, inclined to sit in the back row and sort of let this group act independently. And in, in the retrospect, I wish I had done what my successor did, and that is, was to sit at the front with the leadership so that there would be that symbolic uh, 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 impression that we are in this in, in partnership. Uh, that that I, I, I would do over again, uh, but in, in terms of the bishops as a whole, uh, I found them to be uh, good brothers and sisters in the faith and in, in the work of the church. And treasure, treasure the, those friendships. When we come together now, I mean, it's, it's family time. It's a wonderful experience. Uh, one of the things I envisioned before I was elected uh, in the speech that I made at the Constituting uh, Convention was a church with greater diversity. Uh, we, we, we are in a culture where it is changing very rapidly, and we, we were and continue to be overwhelmingly a white middle-class church. So when I see now that many new missions are being organized in communities of, of diversity, I find myself saying this is exactly the direction this church ought to be going. Now that that is, there's a price to be paid for that because the uh, the growth in some of those missions is not dramatic. In fact, it may be rather slow. But we 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 simply must go into those places. I, I believe, plant the seed, establish worshiping communities, and then pray that they can grow and expand. Uh, to me, that that's a very strong hope. I go back to, to the primary emphasis on word and sacrament, that to be evangelical is to focus on the centrality of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, uh, that uh, we, we uh, come into communion with him by baptism, we're buried with Christ by baptism into his death, raised with him in his resurrection. So baptism is, is at the core of what it means to be evangelical. And then the building on that, it means to proclaim that good news of, of evangelical freedom in Christ, that the good news sets people free. Last Friday, my wife and I had a marvelous conversation with a gentleman who was 
who was completely overwhelmed with problems in his life. And it, it was a great joy for us to, to share the message with him and, 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 and watch the reaction that God accepts him and his family just as they are and loves them just as they are and sets them free. That's the heart of what we've got to do, to be evangelical. Christ is saying no barriers, no walls, no fences. Everyone is welcome uh, in this community. We're, we're so happy to belong to a church that, uh, that uh, says on its bulletin cover every Sunday morning, everyone is welcome here. And to mention people of racial background, people of different sexual orientation, people of different economic status, uh, that's, that's, that gives me a thrill to sit down there and say, we're saying to this community, whoever you are, Whatever your place in life, you are welcome in this place. And, and uh, th this, of course, represents a dramatic transformation for this person whose first 30 years were spent in a church where we not only thought of ourselves as Lutheran, but as Swedish Lutheran. And, and, uh, uh, and then to be ushered, first of all, into the LCA, which was a new day, uh, and then into the ELCA, where now we have these, these uh, multiple families of faith. When I, when I read about the numbers of languages that are spoken in uh, the uh, Metropolitan New York Synod, for example, Bishop Rimbo talks about that, it boggles my mind that, that we, are, we are that multicultural. But that's the hope for the future. People identify with the church primarily through that local congregation, which is very good, very positive. Pastors have to work very hard at connecting people to the other expressions of the church and helping them realize that we need them if we're going to be effective locally. That, that we need sister congregations doing mission for us in this synod and above all, we need the ELCA uh, in terms of our national mission and then the global mission through the, through the Lutheran World Federation. That, that, uh, Hard as it is, we just have to keep at this and at this. And, and uh, I, I have to say that it's, it's a great grief to me when I come into a congregation where pastors and, and lay leaders have not, have not done, or have done almost nothing to give people this vision. And then to go to the next congregation where you see that people are very much alive and aware of what's going on through their synod and, and through the churchwide organization. And as I look back, uh, if there's anything that, uh, uh, that I did and, and initiated that I think has been a great blessing to the church uh, as much as anything else, it was the Companion Synod Program. It, it was my vision early on that somehow we've got to connect people in our synods and local congregations with the rest of the world. And so I thought to myself, how would it be if every synod had a companion church someplace around the world? And I, I, this was part of our Mission 90 emphasis uh, early on. And I gave the idea to, to uh, the Division for Global Mission. And thanks to Mark Thompson and Bonnie Jensen and folks like that, they took the idea, they ran with it. And now I go to synod assemblies, for example, and I'll see here's a visiting delegation from South Africa or or from Hong Kong or where have you, and people are saying, isn't this a wonderful thing to be doing? And I sit there, I don't care that they don't, they don't know that I was the one who initiated the idea. It's happening and it's really connecting us. And then of course to, to uh, connect with, um, uh, with people who are making the return visits and going to places all over the globe and coming back with these important stories of how we are to relate to them. And that's where interdependence really, really comes down to the nitty gritty. I mean, that's when you really understand how important it is to link First Lutheran Church here with a congregation or people in Africa or, or Eastern Europe or where have you. If I can use the analogy of giving, I've been a lifelong uh, advocate of the tithe, that people should share at least 10% of what God has given them. And the reason for doing so is not that you may not need that money yourself, but it connects you with the world. And I feel the same way about congregations, that, that um, if, if, as you say, you circle the wagons and begin to protect yourself, then it's counterproductive and eventually you become so ingrown that you, you, you just collapse. You, you have to have a vision. 
just as I have to have a vision, a congregation has to have a vision of, of how they can be connected with that entire world out there. Uh, that was a, a big motivation uh, for me when uh, early in the church we were uh, asking the question, I was asking the question, 10,000 congregations, how am I going to connect with them? And I had the idea, why don't I try a video series and see if, if, uh, if that can't be a way of relating to people in these local congregations. So I dreamed up the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the video, which we call, What Does It Mean to Be a Christian? And, and we, we had six segments in it, including, you know, how do we look at scripture? Uh, what about the centrality of Christ and, and the Trinity? Uh, how does the church engage in social ministry, education, and so on? And the up, the upshot of that effort was was very heartwarming because pastors were looking for some way to relate to the this new church, and and that video series uh, was used in the vast majority of congregations across the ELCA, and it was very pleasing for me when I would come to a synod assembly. Uh, people would come up to, ins to me and say, you know, because of those, uh, those videos you provided, we feel like we kind of know you. Now, that was not a personal agenda for me. A bishop is a symbol. And you're in office for a while, the symbol is gone, and then you're gone with it. But while you're in office, you are a symbol. And, and if you, as, as, a, as, a, as a bishop, can represent what this church is supposed to be through your teaching and your preaching, then I think you are doing what a bishop needs to do. And, and that was my passion uh, early on. Obviously, I've taught Lutheran church history, and, and you, you have every, f every form of uh, organization you can possibly think of if you look back through the years. Some are very, uh, very um, uh, congregationally oriented. I went to a college that was part of the Lutheran Free Church, and they were fiercely congregational in their organization. Uh, on the other hand, you have the old Buffalo Center, which was very, very much centered in, in, in the bishop and the leadership. I think we have the right blend because this, this uh, lifts up the importance of the congregation. It connects them over a relatively small region with other congregations, and yet we, we keep saying it's important for us to be together in mission as an entire church body. So, it may need to be tweaked a bit now and then, but I like the idea and we need to work at it. I, I am uh, proud of a church like ours, which is courageous enough to take on controversial issues, issues that we know will be divisive to one degree or another, and yet willing to wrestle with them rather than turn our backs on them. When we dealt with abortion, for example, we knew that that the, the divergence of opinion in the ELCA was, was enormous. And yet we, we worked extremely hard and brought together a statement on abortion which has been a model for other churches as well. Uh, sexuality has been an issue for, for us from, from day one. Uh, in 1989 there were 13 synods that said we need a study on sexuality and family life. And, and we shuddered in Chicago because we, we were so young at that time uh, and I kept thinking, this is too soon for us to get into this. And it, it, in many ways it was. Uh, and yet the church kept on. Uh, people kept calling for uh, 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 a study of this matter and some decision making. And, and it took years for us to do it. But, but I'm, I'm, in, I'm immensely proud of a church that has had the courage to address controversial issues because through them, uh, race could be included here too. Through them, we, we send a message to people out in the world of the kind of church we are and the kind of folks who are welcome to come and be part of this worshiping community. The essence of being Lutheran is to believe and to let the world know that in the midst of our brokenness, God comes to us in mercy and love and sets us free through the cross. And that brings us right back to word and sacrament because that's what it's all about. And uh, there will be issues that will come along periodically. Uh, I said to uh, a group in California a couple of weeks ago, what would you think if I told you here in Southern California that there's never going to be an earthquake here again? <laughs> well, 
they just broke out in laughter. I mean, that's foolish. I said, well, that's the way the church is. We stick to the basics, but periodically there are going to be issues that are going to be like earthquakes. Some will be minor, some will be major, but we hang on to our identity, justified by grace through faith and willing to look at the difficult issues of life. I think that's what it means to be a good, solid, healthy Lutheran church. I feel the critical issue is how do we, how do we use the Bible? And uh, I, I remind people that we live in a culture where religious fundamentalism uh, has a high hand today. And the tendency among the fundamentalists is to see the Bible sort of as a straight line with every verse along that line of equal value. So you pick out a verse here, a verse here, a verse here, and it's as valuable as any other verse. So you go to Leviticus and you equate that with what Jesus said, or John 3.16. That's not the Lutheran way. Uh, the Lutheran way is, is to see the scripture in terms of, of a circle. And that circle is the canon of the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible. But as um, inheritors of Luther's understanding, not every book of the Bible or every verse is of equal value. He, he moved some of them way out to the edge and said, uh, you know, this, 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 this is not central. Uh, for us, at, at the center of Scripture is that it points to Jesus Christ uh, as our only hope. And then Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of the whole world. And so we, we judge issues according to how they relate to that center. Uh, for that reason, the church has to change its mind from time to time. Uh, even Luther thought that the world had to be flat. He was sure of that. And, and, and as, we, 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 as we know, the Roman Catholic Church condemned some of its uh, wise scientists for insisting that the sun, not the earth, was the center of this universe. Well, we had to change our mind. And so we're changing our mind constantly. We, we went through a time when, when uh, we thought uh, women should not be ordained. If you had asked me when I was ordained in 1958, do you think women should be ordained? I would have said, no, I don't think so. And why not? I would have said for the same reasons Missouri and the Roman Catholic the Orthodox resisted today, and that is that, uh, that Jesus didn't choose any disciples who were women, and we've had all these uh, centuries of tradition without women, we don't need them now. I would have said that at that time. If you'd have said, guess what? Your wife's gonna be a pastor someday. <laughs> I would have laughed. I would have fallen over laughing. I had to live through that. And, uh, and, and, and when the church began to look at this issue, uh, as a faithful pastor, I said, okay, I'm going to look at this. And I studied the scripture passages and uh, the materials that were being made available to the church. And I said, you know, I was wrong about this. I think that, that, that Jesus and his message and the total message of the gospel and the role of women in society today, the education that they have and the opportunities they, they have to, uh, to hone their skills, uh, there's no good reason to keep them out. And so I was very early on in supporting the ordination of, of women uh, uh, in, our, in our predecessor churches. And I've often said, had we not made that decision, we would have a shortage of pastors in our church today that would be like the shortage of priests in the Roman Catholic Church. It was an absolutely important and time. Uh, many times when I'm awake at night, uh, if I can't go back to sleep, I just let my mind rove prayerfully over the church. I don't know so many bishops anymore, but I still, I still even pray for a, a synod where I don't know the bishop, because I know that the role that, that you folks play is absolutely critical to the vitality of the church. And, and of course, we pray for our pastors uh, here in our local congregation. Uh, my, my hope is that we would be a praying church, and especially uh, lifting up and supporting in prayer uh, those who are our leaders. And having been in that place, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it when people would say to me, Bishop, we're praying for you. What a, what a sense of, of, of encouragement and, and stability that gave to me uh, during my ministry, just to know that there are people out there who are praying for you. On, 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 on a regular basis. And then uh, my hope is that even though it is painful for us as it is right now in the life of our church, that, that we keep on having the courage to push the edges of diversity 
and, and to make sure that the world knows that in this church you are welcome because here we have the treasure of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. That's my vision. That we would be a church so deeply and confidently rooted in the gospel of God's grace that we are free to give ourselves joyfully in witness and service.